Um, again, welcome to people who are just tuning in. Uh, we are, this is the Center for Southeast Asian Studies Friday Forum Lecture Series, and uh, it's great to see so many people uh, tuning in to hear our talk today. One quick announcement before I uh, introduce our talk is that we have other upcoming events, but the, um, the next Friday Forum Lecture will be in two weeks, and that is by going to be by Tyrrell Haverkorn. We're very excited about that. And the title of her talk is Drafting Justice, uh, Jurisprudence and the Struggle to End Dictatorship in Thailand. So really timely, very exciting subject. And I'm really looking forward to that. So don't miss that again, two weeks from right now. Uh, let me see if there's anything else. Does anybody else have any more announcements before we begin? Okay, looks like nobody does. So again, welcome. It's great to uh, be having our second Friday Forum lecture of the semester. And this talk will be by Professor Ian Baird, who is the director of the Center for Southeast Asian Studies. And so um, it's terrific to have him give a talk for us on, uh, well, the name of the talk is The Rise of the Brow, but it's based in part on his monograph, and I'll share this screen with you uh, so you can see the cover. There you go. So this uh, book, again, is based on Professor Baird's new book, which is featured in the Center for Southeast Asian Studies' increasingly distinguished Southeast Asian monograph series, uh, which is published through the University of Wisconsin Press. And so without more introduction, I will let Ian take over the, um, the mic and present his talk. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Mary. Um, okay, so uh, I'll just uh, share my screen to get us started. Okay, so uh, thank you everyone for uh, coming for this talk. Um, I'm going to bring you through uh, a not a very well known history, but an important one, I think, um, in, in a kind of whirlwind way, much uh, quicker than the book does, but that's the nature of the amount of time we have available. So essentially, uh, before I start, I should probably give a little bit of an introduction to who the Brow people are in case you're not familiar with them, because they're not a widely known group. Um, they, they speak a Western Bernaric language, and uh, they're, uh, there's about uh, nine different subgroups of them, and they uh, live in southern Laos, mainly in Adipur and Jumpasak province, and in northeastern Cambodia in uh, Ratnakiri and Stung Drang province. And uh, here's a picture of one of their houses that I took in the 2000s, just to give you a sense, these people live uh, in, they, they, they move their villages around and therefore they make uh, rather small houses made out of bamboo and wood that they can move easily. Here's another, another house of theirs, just to give you a sense of, of how they live. And uh, quite often, uh, I spent a lot of time, I did my master's and PhD research with this group. Uh, in the 2000s. And so uh, I spent a lot of time with them in these kind of situations in uh, gatherings when they were playing gongs. And, and uh, uh, one of the things that they like to do a lot is uh, drink uh, jar wine. Uh, here's a, a picture of some women uh, doing that in, 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 in one of the villages I worked in. And they are Sweden cultivators. So they uh, cut down forest areas, burn them, uh, cultivate crops for usually a year or two and then they move to a different location. They tend to rotate around between different air, between different Swedens. They are uh, animists, so they uh, sacrifice animals um, to, to give the, the meat of those animals um, to spirits to help them to get those spirits to uh, not cause them troubles. There's a picture of an old man uh, sacrificing a small chicken because his wife is sick. But the most important animal that they sacrifice are water buffaloes. And uh, this is a picture of a, a ritual that's going on in which a water buffalo is about to be sacrificed. 
And I won't show you any pictures of them actually being sacrificed because it's a bit gruesome. And then after sacrifices are finished, they mark the locations of sacrifices with uh, uh, certain ritual items. Um, this is called uh, Brahanoi, uh, which is, uh, but different, different subgroups use slightly different uh, markers. And there's about 60,000 Brow people in total in all the different subgroups, about half of them live in Laos and half of them live in Northeastern Cambodia. Today, we're gonna to be mainly talking about the ones that live in Northeastern Cambodia, and particularly the subgroup, the Brow Amba, uh, that live in uh, the Wang District, Ratanakiri province today. But more generally, we're gonna be talking about Northeastern Cambodia and particularly the four provinces that I've shaded in the, in the map that I'm showing you now, which is uh, Previhir province, Stung Treng, Ratnakiri, and Mondokiri. Although most of what I'll be talking about, about will be based in Ratnakiri, where the Brow come from. Although in fact, Brow, the Brow were working in all four of these provinces um, during the uh, uh, People's Recompense, People's Republic of Kampuchea era between 1979 and 1989, which is, which is what I'm gonna be focusing on in this talk. Um, here is a picture of uh, some brow women in the 1980s. Uh, you notice that they have these big plugs in their ears uh, made out of uh, elephant tusks, which is, a, which is something that uh, young people don't do nowadays, but older people, you still find them with those, uh, those, uh, those plugs one of the distinctive aspects of, of them. And this, uh, the man who's shaking uh, hands with uh, one of the women, so he's uh, Bhutong, which was the, he was the Minister of Defense in Cambodia during the PRK period. Um, and I'll be talking a lot about him later. Uh, he, uh, he was one of the most important informants uh, for me in, in, in this research. So, let me talk a little bit first about what motivated me initially to do this research. Um, initially, I was quite interested in why the Brow people in Northeastern Cambodia, who I was working with on other uh, research initially, were so positive about the 1979 to 1989 Vietnamese occupation period of Cambodia. Because for many Cambodians, this period is not considered to, to be a very, uh, it's kind of a, a bit of a dark age because uh, civil war, um, Vietnamese occupation, uh, a lot of poverty, uh, and uh, difficult political circumstances at that time. And yet, the Brow people that I know in Northeastern Cambodia often view this period very nostalgically, and I'll explain a little bit why that is as we continue. Um, and in particular, you know, why are these people uh, seeing the uh, PRK period or the People's Republic of Kampuchea period as a kind of a golden age. So uh, yeah, that's, that's, that, that's what initially motivated me to, 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 to write this book in particular. And I want to uh, kind of present uh, an, an opposing idea that you hear quite often um, by uh, lowland Khmers, you know, the idea that uh, the Vietnamese um, came to Cambodia and uh, you know that they were not really there to uh, liberate the country um, from the Khmer Rouge in 1979, but in fact they were there to kill the Cambodian people and take their property, which is a view that many uh, lowland Khmers hold. And I'm gonna explain a little bit why many lowland Khmers have a different view um, than uh, the Brow. And that'll become clear as we continue on in the presentation. So it were, they're, they're men like this, uh, Mr. Bouma and others were the informants. Most of my work has been based on oral histories taken from these older men. This man was in the Cameroon for many years. Uh, he's actually from the Goet subgroup of the Brow. And quite often I spent time sitting around with uh, jars of wine, talking with some of the older men uh, who were uh, able to tell me their stories and their history. Um, as, as they saw it. So essentially to start the story off, it's worth saying that, you know, during the first Indochina war, when, the, when mainly Vietnamese were fighting against uh, the French colonial powers, um, some Brow did get involved as allies of the Vietnamese during that period, but they were mainly, uh, you know, carrying uh, things for them and acting as guides, 
and scouts and things like this. They weren't really that much involved in the actual fighting that occurred. But they did join the, uh, the communists at that time. And once the first Geneva Accords were signed in 1954, there wasn't uh, a special place for people in Cambodia who were communists to stay like there was in Laos or in Vietnam. So many of them walked from northeastern Cambodia through Laos up into uh, northern Vietnam where they stayed in the Hanoi area and they became known as the, the Khmer Hanoi. And I'll be talking a little bit about them as well. So there's a picture of some of the Khmer Hanoi in 1958. So these are Cambodians, uh, some of them ethnic minorities, some of them ethnic Khmer, some of them ethnic Lao who had come from Cambodia and were essentially studying up in Vietnam uh, uh, beginning in 1954 up until the 1970s. And at the same time as those people were studying up there back in Cambodia, Cambodia had become an independent country and uh, the capital city had been moved to Lompat on, uh, on the Shreipok River. You can see that in the sort of middle of the map. Uh, Leban Siak was the, 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 the settlement that is near the present capital of Ratnakiri, which is Ban Lung, but Ban Lung didn't exist at that time. It was, there was just Leban Siak. And during this time, um, the, the new post-colonial Cambodian government was very interested in trying to um, gain control of their territory fully. And they had a nation building project. They wanted to, and they were a bit shocked when they came up to the Northeast and they found that many of the people up there didn't speak Khmer, didn't know uh, Khmer culture uh, very well. And so there was a big uh, initiative to try to uh, uh, change those people. And here's uh, Noridom Sihanouk visiting in the 1950s um, to Rat Nakiri. And, 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 uh, and there's another picture of him with uh, a, a brow woman or, or maybe a, a Grung woman at that time. Grung is another subgroup of the brow in Rat Nakiri. But in particular, uh, they resettled a lot of people uh, from the uplands, uh, especially Brow people, from the mountains down to the lowlands, and then they set up schools to teach them Khmer. Um, and that, that's what they did in the northern part of the province. And in the central part of the province, they cut down a huge amount of forest and uh, created this massive uh, rubber plantation, which is uh, still there today. Uh, a lot of villages were uh, resettled as a result. And uh, this created a lot of anger amongst the ethnic minorities at this time for being displaced by uh, this rubber plantation, which was actually owned by the Cambodian government, but was run by a French company. And therefore, many people thought it was actually a continuation of the French period, especially because a lot of the ethnic minorities had to work, were forced to work on this plantation, that sort of like a corvee labor kind of idea, even though it was the post-colonial period. They were expected to work two weeks a year on this rubber plantation, and many resented that. So because of this, uh, uh, many ethnic minorities were upset about what was happening in, in, in northeastern Cambodia at this time. And in the early 1960s, we started to see some uh, brow people and other ethnic minorities joining the Khmer Rouge and going to live in the forest, especially in the northern part of Rat Nakiri in, in Brow areas in particular. Um, and over time, uh, the, the sort of armed struggle kind of emerged in the late 1960s in this area. And Rat Nakiri became a kind of key Cameroon strong, stronghold uh, throughout the country at this time. And most of the rank and file people in the forest initially were mainly Brow people at this time. But apart from them, the Khmer Rouge leaders were also there. Uh, they, uh, in, in the 1960s, Pol Pot was there, Yang Siri was there, Son Sen was there, many other Khmer Rouge leaders were there. So there were the small group of, uh, of ethnic Khmer, um, Khmer Rouge leaders, and then a large number of ethnic minorities who were working with them at that time. <coughs> and uh, in 1970, in March, April 1970, uh, there was a coup in Cambodia in which uh, Lol Nol's forces, uh, you know, took over the government and Nordum Sihanouk was, was taken out of power. And uh, soon after the pro-American government uh, decided that uh, things weren't going well for them up in the Northeast of Cambodia and that the best thing to do would be to withdraw all their troops from the Northeast and turn the Northeast into a free fire zone. Uh, 
because once their troops were out of there, they could start intensive uh, carpet bombing, other forms of bombing, because they were mainly interested in targeting the Vietnamese who had some big camps in Ratnakiri on the other side of the border from Vietnam, and, uh, but were actually focused on what was happening in Vietnam. So they wanted to hit those, uh, those Vietnamese forces with uh, bombs. So there was a huge amount of bombing that occurred, uh, actually beginning in around 69, but really uh, increased a lot after March, April, 1970, when, when uh, the government forces were withdrawn. And then that bombing was very intensive until uh, 1973, when uh, it finally ended. And this area was also the first sort of liberated Khmer Rouge area in the country. So whereas other parts of Cambodia were not liberated by the Khmer Rouge, some areas, especially Phnom Penh, until 1975, in Ratnakiri and northeastern Cambodia, in 1970, the Khmer Rouge were already in full control. And so after 73, when the bombing start, they started to be able to, you know, implement the government that they wanted in the Northeast, even though they hadn't taken Phnom Penh yet. Now, at this time, um, there was also a lot of these uh, Khmer Hanoi that had gone up to Vietnam in 1954, started to return to Cambodia. And they uh, walked along the Ho Chi Minh Trail from Vietnam. Uh, they returned between 1969 and 1972, and there was over a thousand of them that came back. And they had received many, many years of training, military training. Some of them were doctors. Some of them uh, had learned other uh, things, but largely a uh, fairly educated group because they'd been over 10 years in Cambodia study, I mean, in Vietnam studying, sort of waiting to the opportunity to return. But there were two individuals in particular who were Khmer Hanoi who returned from Vietnam at that time. And they ended up being very key sources of, for, for this uh, book. One was uh, Bhutan, who I already introduced earlier. The other was Soi Gao, who was a uh, Grung, which is a Brow subgroup. And these were, they, they were childhood friends uh, living along the Seisan River before 1954. They both joined the Khmer Rouge or the communists in 1954 and ended up both going to Vietnam and, all, and came back to Vietnam together. Both of them had received advanced military training in Vietnam when they returned. Um, and most of these Khmer Rouge were not actually very well trusted. Uh, these Khmer Hanoi were not very well trusted by the Khmer Rouge because they had spent so many years in Vietnam. And at that point, the Khmer Rouge were becoming increasingly suspicious of Vietnam. And so many of them were put into frontline positions or other dangerous situations. Some of them were purged and killed. And the vast majority of them died within the first few years of returning. And actually, to this day, there's probably only a few of them still alive. Um, both uh, Bhutan and Soi Gale, who are in this picture, just died in 2019. And I'll talk about that a little bit as we continue. So in 1973, when the Khmer Rouge started to uh, begin to govern as the way, you know, once the bombing ended and they were in a situation where they were basically able to start governing as they wanted in, in, in the Northeast, they started to become more and more draconian in, in their ideas of how to govern. Initially, they'd been fairly moderate, but once they were in full control in the Northeast, they started to be more draconian. Uh, one particular village, there was a, uh, a person who was killed for allegedly contacting with Vietnamese. Um, there was another relative of the village leader that they wanted to catch and presumably kill as well. And this caused the first village to totally uh, uh, move and take off from their village site and go to Vietnam and settle in Vietnam. And so that started in 73. But the vast majority did not leave until 1975. Some of them uh, wanted to go earlier but uh, in fact, the, the Lao and the Vietnamese were initially hesitant to allow them to leave because they didn't really want to have a problem with the Khmer Rouge. Um, so initially they uh, kind of urged them to try to stay in Cambodia and resolve their uh, problems with the Khmer Rouge. But over time, things got worse. And eventually uh, over 3000 people, plus a couple other thousand that left separately, uh, decided that they would uh, leave en masse and basically the whole Brow population, basically almost all the Brow and Ba people that uh, lived in, in Northeastern Cambodia. Uh, and, and really there are, there were no Brow and Ba living in any other country. So the, basically the whole population at that time uh, essentially got up and they took them a few months to walk en masse, you know, women and children and, and, and men, the whole, whole people. And eventually they 
uh, made it to uh, the border with Vietnam and the Vietnamese allowed them to enter and they were allowed to set up their own uh, sub-district or commune in uh, Dak Klang district, Yalai Guntum province. And that was called Yapok was where they lived. Um, and so this was a, uh, and then, a, a, but some of those Brow people uh, spoke Lao quite well and they were actually more familiar with Lao people than they were with Vietnamese. And they would, they preferred to become refugees in Laos rather than in Vietnam. So about half of that group then left from Vietnam and went to Laos and became refugees there. So you had these two groups of, of people that had fled and they, they, they basically arrived in Laos and Vietnam around the exact same time that Phnom Penh was falling to the Khmer Rouge in 1975. So these were some of the longest uh, allies of the Khmer Rouge, but they were the first to, uh, one of the first groups to really uh, get away from the Khmer Rouge when they saw what was happening wasn't what they liked. And so, um, but they were, but they were communists, right? They were, they were, they were committed communists and they were allies with the communists in Vietnam and they'd worked with them even since uh, before 1954. And so they had pretty good relations with them. And initially the, the leader of this group was a brown man. So he's the one, uh, the younger one on the, uh, on the right hand side. Um, and he was named Boon Mi. And uh, he was the first leader of the communists uh, and also the leader of those who left to go to Vietnam and Laos. And it was actually him that had the conflict with the Khmer Rouge that resulted in everybody else leaving. So he was a very, very important person in, in this story. However, uh, due to an, an, an injury that he had earlier when he was a Khmer Rouge sol soldier in the early 70s, uh, he had, uh, had some kind of uh, medical problem which actually caused him to gradually be, go crazy. And he became, uh, at the time that they left in 75, he was already a little bit crazy, but things got progressively worse. And they, his friends and, and allies tried to kind of prop him up for a little while, uh, even though he wasn't really thinking straight. But eventually, uh, there was, it was clear that he couldn't continue as the leader. And he was sent to a, a hospital, a mental hospital in Vietnam, Vietnam, where he spent the rest of his life. And uh, the Mr. Bhutan, who's on the left in this photo, uh, kind of uh, took over from him and became the, the, the leader of, of these ethnic minorities that were previously with the Khmer Rouge, but were allied with the Vietnamese and then later uh, arch enemies of the Khmer Rouge. So a lot earlier than some people realize, on July 7th, 1977, the Vietnamese made, had, had made a decision already that they wanted to begin um, organizing an armed force with the potential possibility of uh, taking the Khmer Rouge out of power. And um, initially, I kind of thought, well, this is a lot earlier than what most, most historians believe uh, the, the Vietnamese started to organize against the Khmer Rouge. But the reason that I know that this is definitely the case is because a number of Brow people that I work with actually have this date, which is 7777, uh, tattooed on their bodies. And so they basically got uh, the date that they started um, this movement. Um, you know, on their bodies. So there's no way of uh, getting the date wrong. Um, and so anyway, in this time they started to organize, uh, the Vietnamese set advisors up to Yapok and started to, uh, to work with them to recruit uh, people to become soldiers. And also they sent people to Laos to recruit Brow people that were living as refugees there also to come and join them and become soldiers for liberating Cambodia from the Khmer Rouge. Um, and things progressively got worse um, between the Khmer Rouge and the Vietnamese. Um, on December 31st, 1977, the Khmer Rouge severed diplomatic ties with Vietnam. And then by April 1978, Radio Hanoi was encouraging the Cambodian people to rise up against the Khmer Rouge and bring them down. So uh, there's a lot of other things that happened that period. I'm really summarizing here because of the time uh, issues, but hopefully you, you get the picture. And uh, there's Bhutan with uh, one of the Vietnamese advisors that he was working with. So they worked very closely with Vietnamese advisors. Of course, Bhutan had already spent 16 or 17 years in Vietnam as a Khmer Hanoi. So he spoke Vietnamese very fluently and was able to work very well with the, the Vietnamese advisors. 
and they help to, uh, to train the brow. So here's a picture in Yap Walk of uh, brow, mainly brow people. There were some other ethnic minorities mixed with them, uh, including a few Lao, but the vast majority were brow. And this is where they're starting their military training um, in preparation for what was to come. And there's another picture of them practicing getting into foxholes and things like that, that they were doing at that time in preparation for the future. So on November 25th, 1978, uh, by that point, it was pretty clear that the Vietnamese were, were likely to go to war with the Khmer Rouge because there had been a lot of uh, border fighting already. Uh, the Khmer Rouge had been uh, coming into Vietnam for many years and killing a lot of people. And the Vietnamese really didn't want to fight and they'd been trying to avoid one. But at a certain point, they decided that it was no longer possible to avoid a fight. So they officially uh, allowed the uh, refugees living in Vietnam uh, to set up a group called the United Front for National Salvation of Kampuchea, or the UFNSK, also simply just known as the Front, uh, typically. And uh, the political group, uh, th this also included some of the other uh, Cambodian refugees, such as Hun Sen, Heng Sam Rin, uh, Chia Sim, who had uh, also come over to Vietnam uh, farther to the south and they set up a, a political uh, group at that time. So they were also part of this group. And the leadership group um, included uh, 62 party members, pre-party members from before, uh, when they were still in Cambodia uh, with the Khmer Rouge, and 18 of those 62 were Brow. So the Brow had a very significant role in the early leadership of, of this anti-Khmer Rouge group. And on, November 30th, the leadership went to Ho Chi Minh City to meet and prepare to plan for the future and returning to Cambodia. And uh, finally, uh, and, then, and then the group made a, a quick in incursion into Cambodia uh, to go to the Snow. Just for, just for one day, they literally went in in the morning, came out in the evening, went into Cambodian territory, and in Cambodian territory, they, they officially announced that they were... Uh, an armed opposition group against the Khmer Rouge. And they wanted to do that on, Viet on Cambodian soil for political purposes. Um, and uh, they also brought some senior Vietnamese people with them, like Le Duc Tho, who was one of the architects of the Vietnamese plan. And he was a, a Vietnamese Politburo member. So here are some of those early leaders. Um, you can see Bun Mi there. Um, Soi Gao is... Uh, also there are many of the other leaders, some of the Vietnamese advisors are with them. I won't go through all the names, uh, but uh, th this is the group slightly before they entered uh, Cambodia in 1978. And there's Bhutong. He was making radio announcements uh, that were being broadcast into Cambodia to tell the people in Cambodia to prepare for, uh, to rise up against the Khmer Rouge. And there isn't much indication that there, there were actually that many people within uh, Cambodia that were rising up. It was mostly people that were refugees in Vietnam, but uh, the Vietnamese were very interested from a political perspective of creating the impression that this was a rising up from within. So they were uh, trying to uh, send out as many messages as they could to promote that. Although, and then certainly the Khmer Rouge uh, were very paranoid and believed that there were some people that were thinking about joining this group but uh, the evidence is scant, and it's not clear if there were the, actually that many people or, or not. But many were purged and killed as a result. Finally, on December 22nd, 1978, the Vietnamese army attacked Cambodia from Vietnam, and there were over 150,000 Vietnamese soldiers involved in this attack. There could well have been over 200,000, actually. Um, and uh, the Cambodian refugees were also part of this uh, attack. But the Vietnamese were the ones who took the frontline positions in fighting the Khmer Rouge. And these ethnic minorities essentially came in behind them. That's because there were not a lot of them. There were probably just a couple thousand of uh, 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 soldiers, in, in uh, Cambodian soldiers in the Northeast. And they had plans with these people once they took the Khmer Rouge out of power. So they didn't want them to, to die. Yeah, they were probably just 500 soldiers that actually came in with them. Some others were back at the, at the base at Yapok, and there were also some who didn't, who didn't come till later, um, who were living in Laos. Uh, 
Um, and so actually, they were very concerned about not allowing the Brow people to die. And they actually had, in some cases, 10 Vietnamese soldiers guarding each Brow soldier to make sure that they wouldn't die. And uh, so very few Brow people did die during the attacks. Um, however, a few were shot by snipers, um, you know, that were kind of behind them and they didn't see, but uh, there were relatively few casualties. And, you know, pretty quickly, the Vietnamese were able to uh, move into Phnom Penh and the Khmer Rouge retreated to the border with Thailand. And uh, essentially, the Brow uh, were, were involved in that, but uh, their military role was actually fairly insignificant. Um, but that doesn't mean that they weren't about to play another more important role after uh, the Khmer Rouge were taken from power. So essentially, before even they, they left uh, Vietnam, they'd already uh, put together four brigades, uh, which they were calling brigades. These were actually pretty small groups of just about 100 soldiers each. And each of those were assigned for one of the four northeastern provinces that they would be involved in. And so uh, Ratnakiri, Mondokiri, Stung Trang, and Prevy here. And they also appointed civilian leaders to, the, to each of those provinces as well. So even before they entered Cambodia, they already knew who would be coming the leaders in those provinces and other parts of the country once uh, they had taken over. So this was part of the planning exercise. So that's why these people played such a huge role after 79, because they were literally chosen to these senior positions uh, before they came into uh, Cambodia at all. And I mean, they were pretty uh, uneducated. Almost all of them were illiterate. Many of them didn't speak any Khmer at all. Some of them just spoke a, a, a little bit. Mostly they spoke Lao a lot better than Khmer. Um, and because that had been the Linka Franca uh, within Northeastern Cambodia prior to, uh, to this period. And so uh, they were, you know, they were not uh, obvious choices uh, to be, you know, government administrators or military leaders because they really had no, no uh, uh, education in that regard. But uh, the Vietnamese trusted them because they had been loyal allies with them from the 1950s. They, they left the Khmer Rouge in 75. You know, they, they formed a group to, to support the Vietnamese coming into Cambodia. So they were people that they could politically trust. And they couldn't trust a lot of people that were in Cambodia at that time because they didn't know the extent to which they were sympathetic to the Khmer Rouge. But for these people, they knew that they were not sympathetic to the Khmer Rouge because their actions had showed them that. So that's why they elevated them to positions unlike they'd ever been in before. So here's, here's, a, here's a picture of actually the, uh, the, the PRK leadership after 1979. And many of these uh, people in this, in this uh, photograph, including Chia Sim, Heng Sam Rin, Pen So Wan, you know, were Lowland Kamai, but there are also a number of Brow people uh, and other minorities in this photograph. Bhutong is sitting in down below in the lower left-hand corner. And uh, so these were sort of the, 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 the leadership of the new government that was installed by the Vietnamese once they uh, had taken the Khmer Rouge out of power. And uh, this was, you know, uh, a situation where um, the three countries of, in, of former Indochina, the Cambodians, the Lao, and the Vietnamese had sort of finally come together after, uh, you know, years of conflict. And so this is a photo showing Bhutan representing Cambodia, uh, and then uh, a, a Lao general, and then a Vietnamese general all together, you know, celebrating this momentous victory of 1979. And uh, Bhutan was uh, elevated to the Politburo of the new PRK government and was made the Minister of Propaganda for the, in the country and worked very closely with uh, the Vietnamese leaders. This is uh, 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 the, 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 the Vietnamese leader there at that time uh, who, was, who was in charge with him. So let me talk a little bit about Bhutan before I move ahead. So Bhutan was actually half Dumpuan, half Lao, originally from Ratnakiri province in Wurinsai district in, in Ratnakiri province. He actually spoke Lao much, much better than Khmer. So most of the interviews I did with people for this book were done in Brow language, but he was one of the few who actually preferred to speak in Lao. 
And he actually didn't learn to speak Khmer until he was about 20 years old. So uh, according to everyone I've spoken to, his, his Khmer was never really that good, even though he lived in Phnom Penh from 1979 until he died uh, last year. He was a former Khmer Hanoi, as I already mentioned. So he became the chair of the Central Party's Propaganda Committee initially, a Politburo member in 1981. And then he became uh, the Minister of Defense for the whole country between 1982 and 1986. Uh, after he, later on, he was the vice prime minister, and then uh, he became, a, later in his life, uh, he became a member of the National Assembly, representing Ralph McCurry, and then finally became a senator uh, until he retired just a couple of years ago. And then he literally uh, died just uh, uh, in, in late 2019. Um, you know, I'd actually had a chance to show him the cover of the book before he died. Uh, when I was in Cambodia, but he never actually saw the book come out, which is a real shame because he put a lot of work. I interviewed him multiple times uh, for this book. But he was the kingmaker, essentially. He was basically put in charge of overseeing all activities in the northeast of Cambodia in these four provinces that I mentioned earlier. And uh, he, so apart from being minister, he was also the one who made this, the decisions about this region. And uh, there were other important leaders. This is uh, Kam Lan. He later on became a minister in Phnom Penh. He was ethnic Grung, which is a Brow subgroup. And he was also governor of Ratnakiri for a while as well. Here are some uh, of the soldiers, the Brow soldiers early on when, uh, after 1979, when they uh, were taking over the country, they were being given some supplies here. So many of the Brow people became uh, government officials and soldiers in the new army uh, after they'd taken over. And so there was a lot of opportunities for them because they were seen as loyal followers of the Vietnamese. And some of them, you know, like this guy, he was actually uh, a party secretary in Ratnakiri. Uh, but uh, when he was, um, when I met him, so this is him, a picture of him in the early 80s, when I met him, this is him in, in the 2000s. He's now passed away, but I was fortunate to be able to get a lot of interviews with him as well. Uh, here's uh, Bhutong visiting uh, Prabhi Han, or Prabhi here, uh, in, in the uh, early 1980s, the Vietnamese. And here is him meeting villagers in Sung Tren province in the 1980s. And there's lots of stories I could tell you about what happened in the 1980s. Um, you know, it was a pretty difficult time for a lot of people, but uh, there wasn't much starvation. People were essentially allowed to, uh, you know, do sweet and cultivation again. They were allowed to, to forage in the forest and fish and things like that. So they were able to, they did relatively better in this part of the country compared to other parts. And uh, they were given a lot of freedom because there was a lot of concern by the new PRK government that some people might uh, rebel and go over to the Khmer Rouge side and they were still fighting with the Khmer Rouge in the Northeast at that time. And so the government was very moderate in how they dealt with these ethnic minorities because they wanted to win over their hearts so that they wouldn't join the Khmer Rouge. So this is, you know, one of the reasons why they have an, the impression that it was a fairly good time for them because they, were, they weren't, uh, you know, uh, forced to do too much. They were given jobs, they were given respect. They were the leaders in all the government offices in these provinces, and uh, this was, you know, pretty important for them. There's Bhutan. Uh, I, I never was able to get a good picture of him smiling. He had a wonderful smile, but whenever I put the camera on him, he'd always give this grimacing smile, grimacing look on his face, which I think he would somehow learned from being kind of a, a big shot in the government. When I first started interviewing him, he was very cagey and didn't want to tell me too much, but after we met, you know, 10 or 15 times over the years, uh, he really opened up to me and at the end told me a lot of things that, that uh, uh, he, he didn't want to tell me early on. So the other fella is Soy Gao, who is also an important informant of mine. He's ethnic groom, so he's Brow essentially uh, from a Brow subgroup, uh, another Khmer Hanoi. Uh, he, all, he returned to Vietnam in 1974 after um, it, he also became disillusioned with the Khmer Rouge. Um, he later on became a general in the Cambodian army, working closely with Bhutong. So he was the head of the, he was the chief of staff of the Cambodian army uh, at the same time as Bhutong was minister of defense between 82 and 86. Uh, 
Uh, later, he became a senator in Phnom Penh, and he died just one month before his before Bhutan died. And they were, you know, childhood friends. They'd been together in Hanoi. They were together in this government, and then they died just one month apart from each other. So it's, uh, there's there's a picture of him when he was chief of staff. There is him meeting Supanawong in Laos as a representative of the PRK government, giving him a gift. Then there were others such as Kam Chan. Kam Chan was another senior general in the Cambodian army. He's uh, ethnic Brow, Brow Amba, and uh, he was the uh, head of the military uh, region one, which is the Northeast. And uh, he uh, played a very important role, both at the central government level and also in the various provinces. Um, and I was also able to interview him. He's, he's also passed away now. And there's him also visiting Laos, representing a delegation during the 1980s, during the PRK period. So, as I mentioned before, you know, the Brow people were installed into all these senior positions. I mean, the party secretaries, the governors, the military leaders in all four of the Northeastern provinces were virtually all Brow people were put into those powerful positions. And in some cases, it was a bit tough for them. I mean, one guy that I knew who was the deputy governor in uh, Stung Treng, uh, didn't actually speak any Khmer. So whenever he went to Phnom Penh, they had to take a translator for him because he couldn't speak Khmer enough to uh, talk to other government people. He, he spoke Brow, and I used to talk to him in Brow and also in Lao. He was a very good Lao speaker as well. This is obviously a doctored photograph, but I, I didn't doctor this, but I, I, I love this photograph. This is uh, Yakun, who was a really um, important, uh, he was the governor of Prebihir province for the, most of the 1980s. Um, you can see he, 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 he looks rather formal in this picture, although notice that he has the, you can still see the, the hole in his ear from the plugs that he used to wear when he was uh, living in Ratnakiri, and he was another Brow and Ba guy. So the, one of the reasons I got so interested in these guys is in the early 2000s when I started to do my master's research in northeastern Cambodia, then I met him. You know, he was there just as a villager. By that time, he was no longer governor. He had returned to his village. He was retired, you know, he returned to Sweden cultivation and all the things that other Brow people did, you know, um, and yet he was a great respected leader because of his previous role. And, uh, and I was told to stay with him when I was in this village and I spent a lot of time there. Um, and he was one of the people that essentially uh, taught me how to speak Brow because he could speak Lao quite well. And, and then he helped me to translate and eventually helped me to learn to speak Brow. This is another guy, uh, the guy in the middle, his name is Yangon. He's another Brow and Ba guy. There's a picture of him uh, in the 1980s. And then uh, he, there was him on the left when I met him in his village up the, uh, up, up the book, which, which is another one of the villages that I worked a lot with for, for, my, for, my, for my master's degree. Uh, uh, here's another guy, Yat Jung. He was the head of the military in Mondokiri province. Uh, he insisted on having this photo taken with his favorite jar for drinking. He was a big drinker. He wanted to take the picture with the jar. So I, I, I obliged. He put on his formal, formal suit, but he, did, he, he rarely dressed like that. Most, mostly we saw him around like this. Uh, there he is uh, after a buffalo sacrifice in which they're offering some buffalo meat to the spirits. And more likely seeing him sitting around his, his modest house uh, drinking jar wine was, was more likely the place but in many cases, he was a great informant. Uh, I spent a lot of time with him. Uh, he, was, uh, he knew a lot about what had happened. And uh, you know, he's, he, he was, uh, uh, he's still alive, but quite old. And uh, this is another uh, general uh, who was also a Brow fella, who was very involved and was also a good informant of mine, still lives in Banloon. And this is another, this was the deputy head of the military in uh, Previhir province. Uh, and he uh, is a bit of an alcoholic now and he can't really uh, answer too many questions, but he's still living in, in Ratnakiri nowadays. So essentially, uh, one of the things that the new government did was they established uh, a new uh, provincial capital in Ratnakiri. Previously, it had been the capital had been in Wunsai, and then they moved it to Lompat during the Sihanouk period. And then finally, they, needed, they wanted a new location. They decided to stick it right in the center of the province at present day Ban Lung. And so they basically built this town out of nowhere, out of nothing, beginning in April 1980. 
And unfortunately, I don't have a lot of pictures of that period, but this is just before they moved. They had initially were in Sai. Uh, there's them in 1979. They set the government up there, but then they decided that they wanted to be right in the center of the province. So then they moved the provincial capital. And this is, uh, yeah, this is 1980. They were still in Wunsai, but then shortly afterwards, they moved to, uh, this was like some of the few schools that were in existed at that time. And uh, you can see Ban Lung sort of in the center of Ratnakiri there between the two rivers, Shreipok and Seisan. And that's uh, where the provincial capital still is now. And uh, here's Pensa One, who was the uh, prime minister of Cambodia after 1979. And, uh, uh, and he's coming up uh, to meet the Vietnamese soldiers that were heavily uh, occupying you know, all parts of the country at that time. There was still a lot of Khmer Rouge around. There was still a lot of fighting. And so a lot of, part of the book, I talk about uh, these different military activities and how that all came out. But I, oh, I won't go into detail here now for reasons of time. They also, uh, the Vietnamese were also keen to create better relationships with these people. So they uh, spent, sent a lot of delegations to Ratnakiri. They also uh, invited all the leaders from Ratnakiri to visit Vietnam on multiple occasions to kind of gain better solidarity. So here's, a, here's the governor of uh, Ratnakiri with his Vietnamese counterpart um, celebrating at a, at a dinner in uh, Vietnam. And here's a bunch of the leaders from Ratnakiri with, uh, they took a bus from uh, Ratnakiri to Vietnam and uh, they stopped for this photograph. Um, women were in a pretty uh, difficult situation initially. Uh, there was almost no literate women in Ratnakiri in 1979. And so it was very hard to put women, the government wanted to put women into more senior positions, but it was hard to do so because there weren't that many women who could even read and write. So some of them, like this woman, Adam Chinti, who's a good friend of mine, she was sent to, uh, to Vietnam for a year and a half of, of kind of quick literacy training in, in Khmer language. She studied in Vietnam, but she was studying Khmer. Uh, she was already multilingual. She could speak, you know, seven or eight languages already, but she couldn't write any of them. So she had to learn some Khmer. She came back and then they elevated her to become the head of the women's union in Ratnakiri province. So she was quickly elevated to a very senior position. Nowadays, she's head of, a, of, a, of an ethnic minority, um, the Highlanders Association, ethnic minority NGO in Ratnakiri province. Uh, she's actually half Thimpo and half Lao, but speaks all the life, the ethnic minority languages of Ratnakiri and also Vietnamese. So the Vietnamese advisors, I mean, in many parts of Cambodia, the Vietnamese advisors were uh, not, um, you know, were not liked by the, by the Khmer people that, who felt that they were, you know, uh, taking control of them. But in the Northeast, because people had so little knowledge and they, many of them were illiterate, they actually really appreciated having these Vietnamese advisors. And most of them felt that they were uh, really helpful. And uh, there were very few instances of problems. There were a few, as you might expect, but for the most part, most of these Vietnamese advisors were pretty disciplined cutters that came from Vietnam. And they you know, uh, tried pretty hard and, and, and mostly the ethnic minorities appreciated the work that they did. And that's again, different than what you hear sometimes in other parts of Cambodia. Here's a picture of some of the uh, brow with their Vietnamese counterparts. Um, who they came to know and, and, and quite well. Often they had translators, so they didn't necessarily uh, speak Vietnamese together. There were translators that they worked with, um, but they, they did have good relationships with them. Here's another picture of some of them with the Vietnamese advisors. Um, this is, I like this one because, you know, even the, 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 go the governors of the provinces, of Yakun, the governor probably here is there, the deputy governor Stun Trang is in this picture. They all look kind of like villagers, but actually they were like the most senior, they had the most senior positions at this time and they worked very closely with their Vietnamese counterparts. And, uh, you know, they got along pretty well. This is a Soi Gale hugging his Vietnamese counterpart. Clearly they had very close relationships with the Vietnamese at this time. And some of them were also sent away to uh, Soviet Union, East Germany, Czechoslovakia, um, up until the mid 1980s to receive levels of education. They weren't sent for long-term education like some of the lowland Khmer were because they were deemed to not have enough 
basic education to begin with. So it was more like study tours to kind of expose them to what was going on over there. So there's, uh, and they also went to Vietnam quite often. Uh, this is uh, Bhutan with Pham Dong um, and, and uh, uh, Thia, Thia Ban in, in the background. Uh, there's Bhutan visiting the Soviet Union in the mid 1980s with all his, uh, his Khmer counterparts behind him. Kind of an interesting photo. Um, they also sent some of the leaders, uh, this is Boon Hom being sent to France actually in the, in the late 80s, early 90s. They started to go to Europe a bit, to other parts of uh, non-communist Europe. Uh, he was studying about hydropower dams uh, when he was there and then came back and implemented the first uh, small-scale hydropower dam in Ratnakiri in the early 1990s and also became governor of the province. So finally, in the 1980s, when, you know, uh, the fighting started to end and the government was changing, um, especially when Udentak came in, but even before then, um, a lot of these Brow were not very educated. Um, they were not really able to uh, work very well in these new, uh, increasingly uh, improved bureaucratic situations. So they, they kind of retired and they went back home and the government built houses for them in their home villages or in some of the provincial capitals. And that's after that time is when I tended to, when I met them in the early 2000s, which was a few years, you know, maybe a decade after they'd already returned. But by the 19, end of the 1980s, most of them, except for some in the military and the police, had pretty well retired. So this is Yang Ngon when I met him in his village, the former governor of Mondokiri province, um, in, when he was out in this remote area where I met him. And, uh, you know, when UNTAC came in, so the United Nations Transitional Authority of Cambodia, when they came into power after the Paris Peace Treaty in 1991, um, they established a sort of, you know, uh, create the conditions for uh, an election. Interestingly, De Wang, which had all these brow people as leaders in it, they were the only non khmer Rouge part of the country that resisted in UNTAC coming into this area. They didn't like UNTAC, they didn't like the peace treaty, they felt that they, you know, made a lot of gains against the Khmer Rouge over, you know, uh, decades and that they were afraid that if there was elections that this would be a ploy for the Khmer Rouge to return to power. And so they tried to oppose UNTAC to come in. Eventually UNTAC did come in, but they never really worked that well with the local authorities there who were always suspicious of them as being potentially, uh, so they were very uh, strong advocates of the, uh, of, of the present government and the Vietnamese more generally. And there's a picture of Vir Chai National Park, which is sort of the area where a lot of these brow people moved back to after uh, in the 1980s um, and, and uh, basically north of the Se San River uh, in the Wang uh, and, and that area is where most of them live nowadays in, in a bunch of different villages. So by the end of the 1980s, they were pretty well all gone. The Brow were out of these senior positions that they'd held for so many years. Um, and they, when I met them in the 2000s or 1990s and 2000s, they were already pretty nostalgic, you know, about what had happened. They, they felt that they had had such a high level positions during this period. And now they weren't represented in government in the same way. They felt that the Khmeras had sort of taken over from, from them and that their kind of golden age was over. And many of them uh, continue to feel that way up to now. So in conclusion, um, I mean, and I've gone through this really quickly, I'm sorry I haven't been able to spend more time just for the purposes of time. Um, but uh, it's, it, the, the one, some of the main points that I wanna make from this is that uh, a lot of the, the history work that has been done in Cambodia over the last few decades has been really focused on sort of the central part of Cambodia or if it's more uh, earlier uh, history, maybe Angkor. But when it comes to sort of uh, regional histories or other, you know, uh, uh, histories from other parts of the country, which are more regional, there has been a lot less work. And I think that there needs to be a lot more work. And so I think histories like what I'm presenting here, which I'll call a marginal history, not marginal in the sense in that it wasn't important, but only that it wasn't geographically central. So therefore it's not being well known. The, the leaders that I've been talking about are not you know, household names in, in, to a large extent, and yet they played really important roles uh, during this uh, PRK period, which is a generally un, under uh, researched uh, period within Cambodia more generally. And so we need to think more about regionalisms. I'm thinking about uh, even like Matt True's uh, 
work on Battenbong, um, other work that needs to be focused, uh, if you could focus it more on certain parts of the country, I think there are histories that, that are, you know, in Cambodia, there's been less of a focus on regionalism, I think, than in other, other parts of uh, Southeast Asia. And I think that needs to change to some extent. So, and I think finally, I want to explain a little bit of the historical reasons why the Brow have such a positive view on the Vietnamese as compared to many other Khmer people in different parts of the country. And that has a lot to do with the long-term history where the Brow were never, had, didn't have much contact at all with the Vietnamese prior to, uh, you know, the, the 1950s uh, when, uh, the, uh, when they were fighting against the French uh, together. Prior to that, they really didn't know the Vietnamese that well. The Vietnamese weren't coming from the lowlands up into the mountains very much. They didn't meet them very much. And so the Brow didn't really have a negative view of the Vietnamese. They didn't really have any historical baggage or any sort of historical negativity towards them. So they, they kind of gave them a fair shake from the very beginning. Whereas with the Khmer, there was a lot more history that had to do with, uh, with Khmer Grom, with you know, uh, the Vietnamese moving southwards and taking over uh, Khmer areas in the Mekong Delta. And uh, you know, these were um, you know, difficult periods of history for, for Cambodia. Many Cambodians see the Vietnamese as a, as a kind of aggressor or threat to them. And so when the Vietnamese came to occupy Cambodia, they were much more suspicious of them to begin with as compared to the Brow. And that probably explains to a large extent why um, there's such a difference in terms of how these different groups um, think about the Vietnamese and their role in Cambodia during this period. Okay, so I guess that's about it. We can uh, go to some questions, I guess. Yeah, let's um, open the floor up for questions. People can type their questions into the chat area. Uh, oh, if you're right, okay. We could also have people just, um, well, we don't have a raise hand function, so that's probably the best way to do it. Or you can type into the chat room, uh, I have a question and then we'll unmute you. So uh, when people are ready, you can go ahead and ask the first question, give people a chance to uh, collect their thoughts. And again, I'm sorry for throwing so much history at you over uh, you know, this presentation, but uh, I didn't see any, any other way to do it other than to kind of do it as a kind of rapid history because it's not history that's very well known, but it is quite important history, I think. Well, I, I'm sorry, actually, I forgot the moment where we say thank you for a terrific talk and we all clap. So those of you we can see, you know, hold up your hands and clap. Everybody yeah. else think clapping thoughts and... Um, I think Al, Al, do you have a question now? <laughs> Ian, you had a question? No, uh, Al, Al has a question on the chat. He's the first okay, one. Yeah. So go ahead, people, please give your questions. Um, can you hear me, Ian? Yes, I can. Okay, uh, uh, two questions, uh, not closely related, but uh, just taking notes during your talk. <clears throat> um, the one that struck me most forcefully was your magnificent photograph of that rubber plantation spreading across the landscape uh, yeah. with that, you know, if you will, that kind of imperial reshaping of, 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 of both human geography and natural geography. Yeah. yeah. And, you, you did that a little bit out of, uh, out of chronological context. I infer from the way it was introduced that that plantation was created post untak I think. Uh, no, no. Uh, when was that created? So let, let me explain because- Oh, okay. well, is that the 1950s and 60s? It, it is, it's actually appropriately situated. So it, 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 it started, the first planting of rubber and clearing of areas began in the, in the uh, early 1960s. Um, that photo was uh, basically from the late 1960s. Um, they didn't end up planting the whole thing. They had like 8,000 hectares was the plan and they ended up planting, I think five or 6,000 hectares. And then they had to abandon the plantation in 1969. But the reason why this is such an important um, story, and I'm glad you asked about this, Al, because um, it was really this plantation that, that upset the ethnic minorities to such an extent that they rose up against the, uh, joined the Khmer Rouge and rose up against the CNU government and really created a lot of opposition from local people. But ironically, you know, the same government, uh, you know, the, what is the present government in Cambodia, 
which were, you know, aligned with the Khmer Rouge at that time, you know, greatly benefited from opposition to this plantation at that time. And yet in the 2000s and 2010s, you know, when Vietnamese came to establish similar types of rubber plantations in Northeastern Cambodia, again, they had forgotten the degree to which local people had been opposed to rubber plantations back in the 1960s. And they didn't really learn much of a lesson to that. And now a lot of the ethnic minorities are, there, are very, they are very upset about uh, what's going on when it comes to Vietnamese plantations. So unfortunately, not enough of historical learning by the Vietnamese in terms of what happened in the 60s and what's happened more recently. Can I follow up on that? <clears throat> okay. Um, this is a, a, a kind of a curiosity, a post-colonial use of corvée labor, which you mentioned, yeah. which was once synonymous with empires roughly right. from the 1880s through the 1940s. Yes. And notoriously in Africa, both the Belgians and the yeah. Portuguese had as much as uh, 60 yeah. days of corvée labor. Yeah, right. So we, the, we, we know very little about that experience, right? So can you tell me, you know, uh, first of all, what were the conditions uh, as much as you learned about it? Yeah. So, so what happened was, is this company, which was setting up this plantation, they actually didn't have, they couldn't find many people to work on their plantation and it was fairly labor intensive. And they couldn't convince many other Khmer's in other parts of the country to move up there because in that time, a lot of other Khmer's were afraid of the Northeast because they thought that the ethnic minorities had all kinds of spells that they could put on them and all kinds of magic they could use against them. And so they, they, it was hard to entice people to go there to work. So, the gov so this uh, company, which was owned by the government, but run by a French uh, company, you know, had no place to get labor to plant the rubber. They reverted to this idea of Corby labor, where they said to all the ethnic minority villagers all over the province, that you had to work on this plantation for two weeks a year. And um, you, they were paid for it, but you know, they, couldn't, they, they didn't have a chance to negotiate what they were being paid, but they were paid. So it was paid Corby labor, but many of the ethnic minorities were very resentful because they felt this was kind of a continuation. I mean, I think it's really important to understand that while from, a, from the perspective of central Cambodia, 1954 was the end of colonialism. But from the perspective of people up in the Northeast, in some ways it was the beginning of colonialism because the Khmers were much more aggressive in trying to turn the ethnic minorities into being Khmers compared to what the French had tried to do. And so after 54, there was a lot of these very nationalistic kind of projects. They were sending teachers from the South, you know, to go out and teach these uneducated ethnic minorities very little appreciation of any positive aspects of their own, of the ethnic minority cultures, uh, very insensitive. And this was another big reason why so many turned to the Khmer Rouge. So, you know, it, for them, you know, this was sort of the beginning of the, of the colonial period in a kind of a way for them. Or at least it was a new, it was a new colonial period. It wasn't, they already experienced colonialism. Now they were facing a new kind of colonialism. Thank you. Anne, you have a question? Anne, Anne were you next? Yes. Um, Ian, I, th I think this is great in terms of like the nation building story we usually hear about Cambodia. I mean, I'm reading stuff, you know, Buddhist documents from the 1950s right now. And it's like, this is like, like two different, you know, universes. Yeah. Um, so I think it is really fascinating for that reason as, as a regional um, history and as a different kind of nation building story. Um, but you talked a lot about why the brow were disaffected. Um, so I, I really have two questions. One was, does that, does their, you know, antagonism with the Khmer, with the lowlanders go back further? You know, does it, I mean, was there, was there a history of slavery in this region? Yeah. What were the other sorts of factors coming, you know, into and through the colonial period that might have affected their uh, relationship with lowlanders. Mm -hmm. And second, um, when, they, when you interviewed them, um, 
you didn't tell us at all about what attracted them to communism. So I wonder, was it, was there an ideological attraction? I mean, they were communists for a long time yeah. um, and they were considered, you know, fellow travelers by, by yeah. the Vietnamese for decades and decades. So was it pragmatic? Was it ideological? What, what appealed to them about communism? Yeah. Um, yeah. Those are, those are, those are, those are great uh, questions. Uh, so the first, the, I, I, I was thinking about the second one. Could you just remind me what the first one was there? There's sort of two questions. The first one was about like the, the history of the antagonisms between right. the okay. Brow and yeah. the Khmer. Okay. So, so in that, so essentially there were very, very few Khmer people living up in this region prior to the 1950s and 60s. In uh, 1920 or so, when they did a census in Wurin Sai district, which is where, uh, which included all the brow areas at that time, there were only uh, 12 Khmer people living there in the whole area. Um, and uh, really Khmer people only came up there in large numbers starting in the 1960s when the government was promoting a lot of uh, retired veterans to move up there and things like that. So. One of the big problems was is that the Khmer people that moved up there were kind of shocked. They had no idea that they were parts of Cambodia where people didn't speak Khmer. And they kind of assumed that, that uh, you know, this was another example of how Cambodia was shrinking in terms of power. This is another example of, you know, of something that they need to push back against to, to make their, you know, what they didn't remember was is up until 1905, uh, this had actually been part of Laos. All, the whole of the northeast of Cambodia was Laos until it was transferred to Cambodia in 1905. So, um, so it was really a lack of you know, much contact at all. And so when the Khmer's came up there, they were not very sensitive. They, they didn't, you know, the, also Cambodians and like, you know, the Lao, the Lao had had like a lot of interaction over history with ethnic minorities. But most people that came from Phnom Penh and other places didn't really have much of a history of ever really working with ethnic minorities. So, so they were really like walking around with two left feet. You know, they, they had a hard time, uh, you know, uh, appreciating another culture. They saw that culture as a threat. So they literally moved all these ethnic minorities. They also didn't understand Sweden cultivation. So they moved them all to the, to, to next to the Seisan River. They built, you know, one, two, two kilometer long village with all their houses along there, made these massive schools that they were all supposed to study in. And they didn't think about where these people were gonna get food to eat. And within a year or two, they'd exhausted all the forest around them. They couldn't do Sweden cultivation in that area anymore. And they were becoming increasingly annoyed by the arrogance of the Khmer teachers who you know, insisted that they only speak Khmer to them, that you know, basically insulted their culture and their language and everything about them. And, and so, you know, they were pretty easy to get recruited by the Khmer Rouge at that time. So the next question is, you know, what attracted them to communism? Well, I think it's, it's not so, you know, they were not, most of them were not really attracted to communism per se. They were, they were attracted by the fact that these, the Khmer Rouge treated them with some dignity, you know, they, 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 they treated them, you know, they didn't, they didn't have contempt for them like the lowland Khmer often did. They had, they were more politically astute and they, they understood that they, you know, I mean, by all accounts, I mean, I've interviewed a number of uh, Rao people that worked very closely with, with, with uh, Paul Pot, you know, that they spent month long uh, education, you know, um, you know, studying with him and they thought he was wonderful. I mean, he was in his early days, you know, he was the man of the people and, and, and everybody loved him. But later on, you know, after 73 in particular, right, that everything changed and things started to get a lot more uh, draconian and all. And, and so, and at that point they were, you know, they became allied with the Vietnamese. So they never really um, had, you know, the only uh, non-communist people that they ever really had a lot of interaction with were in the 50s and 60s by these sort of arrogant Khmer's that were coming up and trying to change their lives. So I think it was more being against people like that than being, you know, uh, communist. However, once they did become communist, they did receive all that political training. And by the time, you know, in the 1980s, when they became the governors and stuff, you know, they, they were party members and they had studied a lot of political theory by that time, especially the leaders, not so much the 
the rank and file, but at least the leaders. I mean, to the extent that they could sort of learn things as illiter as largely illiterate people, but uh, you know, they 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 did uh, you know sort of orally receive a lot of political training, um, and mind you, that was probably fairly the ideas were fairly simple and fairly basic. You know, they weren't getting into deep theoretical ideas about you know um, you know Marxism and things like that, but but they were certainly um, you know, committed. And remember, they kind of, you know, even the other thing that even, you know, Paul Pot thought about them, and the Vietnamese, I think, thought the same was, is that they would lived in fairly, um, you know, th th their lifestyles uh, before the outsiders came in was fairly communal. I mean, they would, you know, sacrifice buffaloes and eat them as a village. You know, they did a lot of things as a village. I mean, they were kind of communal in their lifestyle. They had their own individual Sweden fields, but they often helped each other to do weeding and, and other things. So there was a lot of solidarity and camaraderie amongst villagers. And so Paul Pot saw this as being kind of, you know, the, these people as, and I think the Vietnamese saw it as well as, as, you know, not being very capitalistic to begin with. And so they presented them as sort of, oh, you're, you guys are naturals to sort of be communist because you you never really went through this capitalist uh, period. And, and so they had this idea that they could sort of go from feudalism right to communism and pass them over the, the capitalist period. Okay, uh, who's, who's next here? Yeah. Hey, you have a question? Um, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you so much attendee and for your eye-opening presentation. So I have w one question and another comment. So my first question is from your research, it looks like um, the brow group is so, so how to say, it's really important to um, forming um, Khmer government after the Khmer Rouge. But I'm kind of wondering why they are underrepresented in terms of um, the mainstream Khmer notion about ethnic minorities. It's like they are underrecognized because most of the time when we, when we look at um, most of the Khmer perceptions, we, we know about the Phnom and the Jarai, for example, but the brow is kind of under-recognized. Well, I think that has something to do with the fact that initially all the ethnic minorities were called Phnom, right? Mm -hmm. So Phnom is a pejorative term, mm -hmm. similar in Lao to like Ka. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a negative term, and so they were all put into this classification. Um, and there's another ethnic group called the Bnong, which is kind of similar to Penang. You know, that's probably how the word it originated from in Mondokiri. Mm -hmm. So they're a little bit better known. I would say nowadays that the Brow are one of the groups that are you know, known as, uh, they're one of the ethnic minority groups that is known pretty well in Cambodia nowadays. You know, I mean, maybe not as well as the Jirai, or the Bunong, but, uh, you know, they are, they're also living in a pretty remote area. I mean, they live in what we would, in, in the very northeastern most part of Cambodia, adjacent to Vietnam and adjacent to Laos, uh, in pretty remote areas. So that's maybe another reason. That area was pretty inaccessible up until relatively recently. So maybe that's another reason. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they, they, these are people that, uh, you know, didn't travel too much. You know, they were living in this area, uh, you know, they were sort of outside of the control of the state until basically the 1960s. Um, and so, you know, um, I mean, when I, when, I, when I met, when I first started going, and I started working with these people first in 1995, when I first went to work with them, um, and there was still Khmer Rouge out there at that time uh, in the outskirts. And, um, you know, they were, you know, they were, uh, you know, they, 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 they were, they're much closer to the Lao. I mean, they, most of the elders speak Lao. And so in, in some ways they were, they were more uh, oriented towards Lao people than they were oriented towards Khmer people from that period of time onwards. So that maybe is another reason. Um, and uh, yeah, they're, 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 you see lots of different spellings in, in Cambodia for this ethnic group though, that both in English letters and in Khmer itself. So it's, 
it's uh, and there's also a lot of subgroups. So, for example, the Grun are a really well-known subgroup of Brow, um, but people often don't realize that they are a subgroup. Same with the Wet, um, same with the Loon. These are all subgroups, but most people don't realize that. They're basically all speaking. I mean, once I learned Brow, I realized I could talk to all these groups, essentially, with just some small differences between their dialects. Okay, and another comment um, regarding one of your slides telling about the strong opposition um, by the, the Brow against the UNTAC mm -hmm. presence in Cambodia. Yeah. Um, for me, it's not surprising and it kind of makes sense because they ally with the Vietnamese back government. Yeah. That's why even like Hun Sen, right. which is part of that. Well, I mean, also, yeah. what, they ha what actually happened was Kam Len, who was one of the Brow leaders down in Phnom Penh at that time, he was sent up to Rat Nakiri to convince other Brow people up there to allow Untek in. The decision to not allow Untek in didn't come from the central government. It didn't come from their own party. It was actually a locally made decision. I mean, I used to get that. I, I'd be out there with these guys sometimes, and 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 I would ask them, oh, "Do you ever go to Ban Lung?" And they said, "Well, we don't want to take a a motorcycle. Dupe. You know, we don't want to hire a motor a motor dupe to take us." And I, said, why not? Well, the driver might be from, you know, the opposition party, right? And so they were, you know, they were always, even even into the 2000s, very paranoid about outsiders uh, and the, and you know, Foons and Peck and, and uh, very, very pro uh, CPP, Cambodia's People Party, very, very pro. I mean, in fact, in this area, in Duang, when they have elections, the commune elections, they could they they had a really they couldn't find anyone to run for the opposition, so what they would actually do is they wanted a proper election, so they would actually get a CPP supporter to sign up as a Funsen Pet guy, and so he could run as an opposition so that they could win a, a great majority for the CPP because they literally could not find people to run for the opposition. That's this is like the the biggest stronghold of the CPP in the in in the country. Thank you. Uh, Huang, you have a question? And I see we have two more questions after that, and that's about all we have time for. So, sorry, go ahead. Hi, right, so I'll try to make it brief. Uh, thank you, Professor Baird, for, for your wonderful presentation, and also thank you for... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Nice to see you. I, I, I use some of your work in my book. <laughs> Thank you for that. That's uh, really <laughs> helpful uh, as a young scholar. Um, I, I really like the, the work and I, I want to just add a little bit uh, from my own interviews with Vietnamese embassy, uh, people who had worked in the Vietnamese embassy uh, in the 80s. Uh, when they talk about Bun Thang, um, they actually talk about him as one of the four m major forces that together compose of the the CPP government, oh well, of of, of yeah. the PRK uh, government, and uh, actually they so they refer to him as the Laotian, weirdly enough, or the forces. Oh, he of, loved he loved to speak Lao. I can assure you, he loved Lao. He would mainly speak to me in Lao, and then now and then he'd speak to me in Brao because he could speak Brao. He just wanted to hear me speak a little Brao, but he really loved to speak Lao. <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> Yeah, and, and so the, the thing is, they they see him and also the, so because he had his own army coming into the movement and also uh, Thie Beng and Sai Fu Tong uh, from the Thai side. So they saw these two forces as actually important counterbalances in the government. And actually some of them kind of privately say that if, you know, the, the, it's actually the decline of, this this force they never use the word brow but uh, they say Bun Tong's uh, faction decline in the government actually led to the imbalance that has led to Hun Sen kind of taking over entirely mm -hmm. this government I wonder in your discussions uh, in your many talks with him uh, especially when he opens up more does he ever mm -hmm. talk about kind of this internecine uh, I guess tensions or uh, balance of power within the the CVP that the Brow were playing out, and and yeah. why they lost out in the end. Yeah, he does talk a lot about that, and there is some parts of the book that I also deal with that a little bit. Um, he, you know, one of the one of the main things he used to talk about later on was the break, taking out of Pencil One when Pencil One was taken out by the Vietnamese, and later on he would say that. Um, I would ask him, you know, you administer, I, I asked him once, 
uh, how many Vietnamese soldiers were there in Cambodia? And he said, well, I don't know. I said, well, you were Minister of Defense. Shouldn't you know that? And he said, I didn't, I didn't ask. And I said, well, why didn't you ask? He said, well, you see what happened to Pencil One when he asked too many questions. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, he, he, he was, he was um, cagey in that way, but he also used to complain sometimes to me. He really wanted this book to be written because and he, because he felt that the, you know, in his, later in his life, he felt that um, even though he was still a senator, his brother is still the member of parliament for Ratnakiri now, his, his son is the governor of Ratnakiri right now. Uh, so, you know, it's not like he, he still had a lot of power, but he felt that the ethnic minorities had really lost a lot of power in Cambodia. He was very disappointed about that. Um, he felt that he didn't really have any power in the government anymore after the, it went into the 2000s, that he had been kind of set aside. And, uh, and so he was, you know, he, he wanted to make sure that Khmer people didn't claim that they were the ones who liberated the Northeast. He wanted to make sure that people knew that it was the Northeasterners that did it themselves. And so he kind of considered me to be kind of his, his autobiographer sort of, I mean, I was the one that he wanted to write the story because he was very worried that it would all be forgotten if it was left to other Khmer people. So even though he lived in Phnom Penh for 40 years, you know, he, he never really was that close to, uh, to the Khmer people that, you know, he, he, he always spoke with a strong accent and, and uh, you know, never, when I go to his house, uh, he would always have ethnic minorities around him. Um, okay, our next question was from Allison, but I believe she's left the group. Allison, are you still there? No, I believe she's left. So we have one last question from Beadworker, and I, that's the only <laughs> name I have up there. So please go ahead with the last yeah. question. Uh, sorry, Beadworker, are you there? <laughs> ah, now you're unmuted, so go ahead. Oh. Are you there? She's... Uh, okay, looks like that is the end of the questions. Was there anybody who had one more? It looks like Huang, you, you still have your hand up, but are you done? Yeah, he said, uh, okay, I believe that is the last question. Uh, Ian, you can read these other questions, but the questioners are, are have left. Um, I was putting up oh. his hand there. Sorry, oh, Al, if you have a question, <laughs> we should unmute you. <clears throat> Can you Last hear me? Question. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> Ian, in your presentation, you showed a photograph of the bombs. And we know from the maps uh, of the bombing done by one of those war projects that the Northeast was one of the areas of Cambodia that was most intensely bombed. Mm -hmm. the, 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 it was almost unimaginable. How did the Brow deal with that? How did they survive? Did they suffer loss? Yeah. I mean, it was pretty tough. You know, what's happened? <laughs> surprising to me is that not many people actually died in the bombing. They would usually hear the planes coming and they would, you know, retreat into, uh, you know, holes that they dug in the ground. And there was carpet bombing, there was heavy bombing. I mean, some people explained to me that the forest was virtually flattened totally, you know, in, in their areas. I mean, you know, it was really heavy, heavy bombing. But uh, surprisingly, um, the number of people killed was relatively low um, because they, they, they could hear the planes coming and they would retreat into them. Remember, this was also the area that uh, the Americans uh, came into in, 19, in, in, in the uh, early 1970s as well. So there were American soldiers literally fighting in this area. And some of the brown people saw American soldiers fighting uh, they, you know, they came in to try to get rid of those Vietnamese strongholds in that area. Um, but there, so there was a lot of fighting and there was a lot of bombing. But, uh, you know, people, you know, surprisingly, you know, it was tough for them, obviously. I mean, I think uh, people, you know, they would, you know, some people said literally they had no clothes. They were running around virtually naked. You know, I mean, at times everything they owned was destroyed, but they didn't own a lot to begin with. I mean, these were people who were very good at getting around the forest, very good at surviving with almost nothing. They could not, you know, they didn't have shoes to begin with even at that time. So when they lost everything, you know, in some ways, uh, 
what they lost was their loincloth, which was about all they had to begin with. So, and they could make everything from, from things that they found in the forest and they could, you know, adapt pretty well because they were so uh, adept at, at living in the forest. But uh, yeah, they, uh, you know, I was always surprised about that, you know, the, the, the degree to which they, uh, that they weren't whole villages wiped out uh, by the bombing. It, it actually didn't happen. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> We do have one last question. Uh, it's Nancy Volk, <laughs> who was bead worker. Uh, and, but if you could answer very quickly, would that be okay? Yeah, 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 I'll answer okay. quickly. So uh, first of all, great talk. And then what was their relationship with the ethnic minorities in Vietnam whose experience with the Vietnamese has been quite different? So if you could give a brief- Yeah, um, well, I mean, you know, when they went into Vietnam, they actually set up their own commune in a place that was virtually uninhabited. So they actually had very little interactions with other groups. But one thing they did do, and this is a bit sad in, in kind of a way, they, were up, they, they set up this area and they, they found that there were some full row people. There were, you know, this was after 75 and full row, you know, was, was getting going and they were, you know, against the Vietnamese government. Some of those full row ethnic minorities were, were living in the forest not far from where they were settled. And they went out there and actually captured a whole bunch of them and, and gave them over to the Vietnamese authorities, which of course, because they were loyal to the Vietnamese. So, so they caught a bunch of dry uh, people living in that area and <clears throat> were happy and they were given rewards from the Vietnamese government for kind of giving up these other ethnic minorities who were against the Vietnamese. So they didn't really have a lot of other interactions with, uh, because there are no brow villages on the Vietnamese <laughs> the border or there is one right now there's one village at this point but it only moved there in the 1970s so they didn't really have much interaction largely for linguistic reasons and cultural reasons and uh you know they the only ones they had contact with with, with the dry and they the dry were basically the bullies on the block you know the dry were the ones that mainly involved in the slave trade and they often have stories about dry giants that would come in and uh, attack them and so um, even though they learned a lot culturally from the Jirai, like a lot of the gong playing and, and other cultural came from Jirai, I think, but they, they really didn't, they didn't go to Vietnam before. They didn't really, you know, have, I mean, they didn't want to, they didn't want to have much contact with the Jirai. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think we need to end there. I do have one last announcement. Um, which I can't give before our next talk. And that is that David Chambers, our very own David Chambers, will be giving a talk for the um, virtual Hmong Studies Consortium, Fitting in or Falling Out of Place, Immigrant Hmong People's Intra-Ethnic Political Positionality in Thailand. That is at 4.30 on September 30th. David Chambers, 4.30, September 30th. And, and just go to our website. And, and just to give a little plug for that, I mean, that's he, he, David's uh, dissertation, which this chat, which is this presentation is based upon, is really the first study of uh, urban Bangkok-based Vietnamese Hmong refugees, uh, you know, and and he really looked in detail at at uh, ethnographically at how these Hmong people from Vietnam were surviving in Bangkok, and I, he's got some great insights. So I would really, uh, even if you're not somebody who's really interested in Hmong, but you're interested in how ethnic minorities negotiate Bangkok, uh, this might also be an interesting presentation for you. Terrific. Thank you so much for the talk and thank you everybody for questions. Um, really appreciate it. And we will see you in two weeks for Tyrrell Habercorn's phenomenal talk she will give next. Thank you everybody.